really see any of you, but uh, I imagine there's a few of you out there. Uh, so yeah, this is my talk. I'm going to talk about um, how to structure your business logic in React and Redux applications. I've been working with React and friends in large production scale web apps for almost four years now. And each time I've gone to build an application with React, particularly when it starts to scale, I found myself struggling with that question, well, where does all the business logic go? All that tricky app-specific stuff. Well, spoiler alert, there's no one answer to this, but I have a few ideas that I'm going to share with you. I'd love to hear your thoughts also. On Twitter, I'm at Rebecca Please feel free to tweet at me. So what do I mean by business logic? Well, generally, this is the code that handles the application of your real-world business rules. So say you have a pet store and you sell tarantulas. Well, maybe you have a business rule that says that when a customer buys a tarantula, they have to fill in a form that says that they won't use it to scare their neighbors. Well, if you're going to put that pet store online, you're going to have to put that business rule into code somehow. For security and performance, much of this validation will be on the back end. But as our front end apps become more responsive and dynamic, obviously more and more of that business logic exists on the front end. So let's split this up into three main areas. Firstly, we have data manipulation. This is where we do our aggregation and filtering of the data that's essential for our business. For instance, say we're working on a website that displays a user's profile. And to display that data, we want to grab data from both the state, where the user's been typing it in, and also from an API call, because they might have saved some data previously. We want to merge those two pieces of data into one object that uh, we can use for our components, where the user input takes precedence. And we might also have some conditional business logic. For instance, on Chrome, if you have no internet, we want to show you a cute dinosaur game. And lastly, we have the area of asynchronous data flow. So this is the logic that manages API calls or other side effects and handles the success and failure of those calls. For instance, we might have a app that translates text real time into emojis. Well, we're going to need some pretty specific logic in order to make that translation service seem really smooth to the user. OK, and what's the problem with it? Well, the problem with business logic is that there's no one solution right now with React applications as to literally where to place it in your app and what tools to use to manage it. And why not? Well, because by definition, business logic is different dependent on your use case. There are so many options out there, particularly in the React module ecosystem. Uh, and the right decision for you will be based on the needs of your application, your team's experience, and also just personal preference. There is no one perfect answer. And the good news is that this means that you can create the exact application that you need with the framework that you need and the tools that you need in order to create a really uh, small and performant structure that works for you and your app. Whatever you choose, though, and especially once your app starts to really scale, the main thing to keep in mind is to decouple your business logic as much as possible from the rest of your application. For instance, avoid putting business logic in your UI components. This makes it much easier to test, easier to change, pull out altogether, and reuse. So the main focus of my talk is going to be on web apps with lots of pages, lots of complexity, developers, and business logic that somehow needs to be coded in a way that is easily manipulated, tested, and extended. And I'm going to focus on apps that are currently in production that you might be maintaining right now. Most commonly, with React, that does mean using Redux. Yeah, OK, it's supposed to be dead by now. This is what I hear. The short answer is no. <laughs> Don't freak out just yet. Learn about it, sure. Come to fantastic conferences like this. Listen to Ken Wheeler and Forms Lindsay telling you about all the new coolness that's in React. But realize that around 50 to 60% of all React apps use Redux. And that user base is simply not going anywhere anytime soon. We can't all go and refactor our massive code bases just because something new and shiny came along. And in many cases, especially in those large, complex applications, Redux might still be your best choice. So obviously, I'm referring to hooks and other things that have come up today. Um, 
I do think that hooks are going to have a massive impact in the end on how we structure business logic in our applications. I say will because remember, this feature is not even stable yet. It won't even be released until Q1 next year, so don't go putting it in production tomorrow. However, I am extremely excited about it. Um, I think it has a great ability to make our code more composable and functional. And when those features become stable and more widely used, more patterns will emerge. But in general, I believe that they will guide us even more easily towards decoupling our business logic in our applications. And if you read in between the Redux lines, that's what this talk is really about. So if you're not working on an existing Redux application, say you're working with MobX or just plain React or you're diving into hooks for some reason, <laughs> that's totally cool. Every app is different. You do you. So a very quick recap, just in case you're not familiar with Redux. The key to Redux is a predictable data flow. So in other words, components use action creators to dispatch actions that are picked up by pure functions called reducers. And these create new versions of the application state for the store. That is in turn read by the components, and the cycle starts all over again. And a func, as I've got here, is a commonly used special type of action creator that uh, is provided by an external middleware package called Redux Thunk that gives us greater flexibility. So let's start with data manipulation, our first area, and a real-world problem. So say you have an online store that sells books, and you've accidentally bought way too many of your best-selling authors, and you need to sell them really quickly. You want to promote these by having a filter on the left-hand side of your app that lists, lists just your best-selling authors. And when someone selects an author, only books written by them display. Well, one way to do this would be to retrieve an API that returns an array of the possible authors that your store socks, inside each of which is a Boolean property is bestseller. You'd then manipulate that data to create yourself another array of only best-selling author names. Well, doing that actual fi filtering is pretty straightforward, but in a React and Redux application, where should we put that function? So the first instinct that many developers have, particularly those new to React, is to put that logic straight into their components. Here we have a product list page container component that renders a filter uh, component that displays the list of authors. To do this in the render function, we have the filtering that we talked about. And we're then passing the result of that into the filter component. Simple and pretty effective. But as soon as you need to do this multiple times for different pieces of data, or you want that same filtering function elsewhere, or the filtering function itself becomes more complicated, things get really messy really quickly. In other words, as a general rule, business logic should not be in components. So another option that sometimes occurs to people is to put this logic in the reducers. In this case, our reducer is receiving an action containing the author's array. It's creating the filtered best-selling author array and setting both of those things into the state so the components can grab whatever they need. Well, the biggest, approach, uh, biggest issue with this approach is that we're storing duplicate data in the state now. What happens when we need to update a property on a specific item? We need to update it in both arrays. We should always avoid putting data into the state if it can be calculated from another area of the state, because it makes it a lot more difficult to manage and increases the likelihood of that data getting out of sync. We also have similar issues as with the components option. Because our filter is not, being, is not able to be reused like this. And the reducer has become more difficult to test, read, and change, because it's now responsible for doing multiple different things. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, so it's now doing multiple different things, uh, both uh, filtering the array and updating the state. And we also have the issue that the reducer only has access to the part of the state that's being passed into it. And with a large application that combines multiple reducers, that can get pretty tricky. Say if our author list was also filtered by a user input handled by another reducer. So most of these issues also apply to your action creators, or thunks. Here we have a normal action creator receiving the JSON response from an API and sending both the original data and the derived best-selling author's data to the reducers to include in the state. Well, we're still duplicating the data in the state, so this option also kind of sucks. 
fortunately, we have selectors. So this concept gives us a single consistent way to accomplish these kinds of data manipulation tasks. Here we have a reducer file that includes a get best-selling authors selector that it contains our filter. And then in our product list container file, we use the selector in the Redux map state to props function. In this simple form, it's really just a nice utility function with the convention that it accepts the entire state object and returns the derived data. This means it's easy to work with, and it can be used in place, any place that knows about the Redux state, usually in map state to props or in middleware tools. They're kind of like database queries for your Redux store, and even relatively simple apps can find them really useful. The key is to be consistent. So by containing all the knowledge about your state shape of your application in your reducers and selectors only, rather than dotted around your components and middleware, refactoring things becomes a million times easier. And the last option for data manipulation that I want to talk about is reselect. So this is just an external library that enhances the selector concept, especially when your app starts to really scale and performance becomes more of an issue. Here we have our get best-selling author selector, which still takes in the state and returns the filtered list we want, but this time it's using create selector from reselect. By doing so, we've created a memoized selector. This means that it only recalculates the list of best-selling authors when the value of get authors changes. So if an action affects any other irrelevant part of the state, this calculation doesn't occur, which can provide big performance benefits in large applications. And it is worth a quick word of warning. Make sure you test to check what you think is happening is actually happening with uh, the memoization especially when you want to start passing props into your selectors, there's a few additional things to implement to retain the performance improvements. So next up is conditional business logic. Let's say that our bookstore only sells really rare, one-of-a-kind books. And there's a business rule that says that customers can only buy one of each book. So we need to add some validation to check that when a user tries to add a book to their shopping cart, we only allow them to do so if it's not already there. Again, the simplest option, and something that I've seen a lot, is just adding this logic in the component. Here, we're handling the click event that runs when a user clicks the Add to Cart button. And if the cart items array includes the ID of the book that's been requested, then we return early. Otherwise, we let the user add it to the cart. And like the last example, this is super easy, and it does the job. But even in very small apps, it feels pretty gross. We have business logic here right at the very front of our application, where it simply doesn't belong. The UI has enough to deal with. So what if we did this in our action creators, or thunks? Well, here we have a thunk called conditional add to cart. It's called when the user clicks the add to cart button. It uses a selector to get the list of the current cart items from the state to check if the new book ID is there. And if it is, then we return out of the function. If not, then we're allowed to add the hook, add the book. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so the benefit that thunks have here over normal action creators is that A, they have access to the state, so we don't have to pass the whole cart items list through to do the validation. And B, they allow you to return whatever you want, including undefined, which is what's happening here if the book does already exist in the cart. And this is not that bad an option, perfectly valid if it works for you. But after a few years of working with Redux, I kind of lean away from this in the majority of the cases. And personally, I try to err on the side of putting more of this kind of logic in my reducers. Conceptually, reducers are designed to look after the state of data. The principles of Redux are that actions are an object describing what happened, and state is read-only, changed by pure reducer functions. The point is to decouple what happened from how the state changes. And action creators like the one I just showed steal all that logic away from the reducer and essentially just tell it what to set in the state, which kind of defeats the purpose of that separation. Some might think, OK, well, I don't want to fire off actions if they're not needed. And that's certainly true if that action is async, which I will cover in a moment. But reacting to synchronous actions and determining whether and how to change the state is the whole point of reducers. There are a few benefits to favoring reducers for your conditional business logic. They're pure functions, of course, so they're much easier to test, maintain, and refactor. 
It also means more of your logic is more easily covered by debugging tools, and you're also less likely to dispatch a bunch of actions from your thunks that cause the UI to re-render, meaning less risk of performance issues and the store being inconsistent. So, now for async flow. What's the best way to retrieve our array of books in the first place? We want to get the data from an API. We want to show a loading animation and handle the success and failure of that API call. By the way, this is a very simple use case which I'm using to, make, uh, to, to show the difference between the following techniques. But do keep in mind that if this is the most complex data fetching situation that your ha app has, then you probably don't even need to use middleware at all. I'll show you some more complex examples that uh, will really help demonstrate the usefulness of these tools. OK, so let's look at Redux Thunk first of all. In our example, we have an action creator called load books here, which is dispatched when the page first loads. Its first task is to, in turn, dispatch the loading books action, which sets a loading animation to appear. It then calls our API service to fetch the books. If successful, it dispatches a success action with the book data. And if it fails, then it dispatches a failure from which we can dis decide to display an error message. And both of those actions also remove the loading animation. Thunks are a really great place to start with when writing React and Redux applications. They're relatively simple. They use the action creator pattern that we're used to. And they allow you to write normal promise or async style code inside them. However, there aren't many options around dealing with multiple requests to the same action. They can be difficult to test because they directly deal with side effects, which usually have to be mocked. And if you're working with a large application, it can get pretty messy, especially uh, when you're, you, you're using the same tool to do multiple things. If you're finding that thunks are not working for you and you need something a bit more powerful, then one of your options is Redux Observable. This library is a Redux-specific implementation of reactive programming using observables based on RxJS, and it makes it easier to compose asynchronous code. The core primitive of Redux Observable is an epic, and these functions accept a stream of actions and return a stream of actions. So here's the example. Essentially here, we're listening to a stream of potential uh, load books actions, and when the page is loaded, our component fires the action, and this epic picks it up. It calls our API service, and then returns either a success or failure action. And compared to Thunks, Redux Observable is really powerful, and it provides a lot of really cool techniques for handling more complicated processes. For example, you can cancel actions, throttle and debounce them, or choose to only act on the latest one. They can also be very separate from your action creators, meaning greater modularity and cleaner code. However, as you can see, if you're not used to the syntax, it's a fair bit of complexity to understand. This library has a steep learning curve, and reactive programming is a completely different way of thinking. Also, the stream concept and the approach to side effects can be tricky to test. Lastly, we have my personal favorite, Redux Saga. Saga is actually an old Norse word that means a long, dramatic story, so I think it's pretty applicable. Redux Saga uses generator functions, which you can see from the functions with the asterisks by them and the keyword yield. They allow sagas to be like a separately running thread in your application. And they mean that your code can be read like standard synchronous JavaScript, kind of like async await, but with a few more awesome features. So here we have a books saga, which takes every load books action that's dispatched in the application and calls load books. And load books calls our API service to fetch the list of books and return it into the book data variable. The function waits for that to complete, and if it's successful, it dispatches fetch book success. And if there's an error anywhere, it catches it and dispatches fetch book's failure. The benefits are similar to Redux Observable in that we have a lot more power about how and when we react to actions. And our side effects are separated from our action creators for a clearer definition of responsibility. Generator functions can also be a bit of a learning curve, but for me personally, they have a few advantages over Redux Observable. For one, sagas, I think, are easier to test. You don't have to mock every, anything because every function is wrapped, meaning you can just test the instructions that it's sending. 
Secondly, and my favorite thing about sagas and their greatest strength, is how they organize your code. The saga functions like put, call, select, etc., are really readable, and the yield keyword means that they can be read, as I said, like synchronous code. Situations where something like Redux Saga really shines are things like a complex reauthorization flow with tokens, or a step-by-step -step onboarding process, and in my opinion, any React, uh, Redux app over a certain size. So, now for some real-world examples. Some I've built, and some are built by others, which I want to show off because I think they're really great. Um, and they are all on GitHub, so you can check them out. So I'm going to start off with something really small. Assuming your app is of a small to medium size, this approach could easily work for you too. Remember, don't include the extra tools and complexity if you don't need it. So this is a little app I made with Create React App and Express. It lists a bunch of solved cases for a detective agency with the ability to filter by year. So you can click through the app. Oh, there's supposed to be a video there. There we go. Yeah, so you can click through the app and check out the different uh, mysteries. Uh, first off, the file structure. Because it's super simple, I've stuck to the Rails style, easy separation by file type. And here's the main container component for the app. If we start by looking at the business logic for async flow, we can see that the component did mount is async, and here it calls our mystery service. The actual API call, though, has been abstracted away into the service so that it's easier to test and update, and gives us a better separation of concerns, especially if we want to add any complexity here in the future. Next up is the data manipulation business logic. Here we're getting the list of active mysteries to render. Note that we're using the selector convention and passing through the state, even though we're not actually using Redux in this app. And in the selector, we're returning the filtered mysteries based on the active filter. By splitting this out, our logic becomes super simple to use, change, and test, because it's a pure predictable function. Next, here's a really cool app from Joshua Como that lets you play around with the web audio API. It has a really smooth onboarding process, which is a perfect use case for sagas. It doesn't hurt that it's also really pretty. <laughs> Each step is based on time and on key presses and mouse movement from the user. And if we dive into the code, you can see he's also structuring his app rail style. And here are the selectors. In this app, they're located in the reducer files. So this is the effects reducer. And if you scroll up, you would be able to see the reducers. And the selectors are down here at the bottom. And for conditional business logic, if we take a look at this go to next stage action creator, for example, you can see that there isn't really any lo uh, real logic here. But with the reducers, there is a fair bit responding to that action and figuring out which stage of the onboarding process to return. And in this onboarding saga, it's picking up that same action. It's going through each of the onboarding steps and then handling a side effect and saving a flag to local storage. And I really love the readability of this app. It's so easy to figure out what's going on. Another step up in size, we have an app from Ivan Mironchik called Do. It's essentially a really nice clone of Trello, allowing you to keep track of your task lists using cards on boards. Because of that extra size, it takes a few more tools to handle the extra complexity. So we've got Normalizer, which is, uh, there's a bunch of schemas in that schemas folder. And selectors here are also uh, separated out into their own folder. And they're not only in their own folder, but the selectors for each high level entity are in their own files. I find apps differ on this a lot based on size and personal preference. But I don't really think it matters as long as your state is still easy to refactor, because that's the whole point. Also, note the use of reselect here. You can see that the create selector um, function is being used here to manipulate the, sh the shape of the state that uh, has been saved from the API calls and everything, and change it into the object that's going to be used for the components. As for conditional business logic, you can see an example of this in this reducer called board create success. We're manip manipulating the list of IDs to return based on whether or not the user is on the last page of the app. And lastly, side effects. 
Here we have a really nice use of Redux Saga that controls a progress bar. The methods that Redux Saga provide come in really handy here. So delay, for example, halts the execution for the amount of time that you pass into it, in this example, for one second. And cancel allows you to stop the saga based on an action being dispatched. And here's an even larger app. So this is a previous project of mine that lets uh, businesses manage their clients. The app is also structured Rails style with folders for actions, components, reducers, etc. But the components folder in particular was getting really big. So we decided to split that up by high level page route with a folder for shared common components. If this app had have continued getting even larger, we may have considered moving the other tools like the reducers into the same page route structure. But at this size, it felt pretty workable and it was nice to navigate around. And here is an example of conditional business logic in one of the reducers. You can see a couple of instances where utility functions in this file, like toggle filter here, are used to make calculations that determine how to update the state. And now the async logic. Here's the search client saga. Using the take latest method from Redux saga, we're saying that we only want the latest search client's action, which is pretty cool. It means that we do fewer unnecessary calls to the API. And here's another example, a saga for editing notes. First of all, it's doing an API call to save the new note data, and then requesting all of the updated notes from the server. It's then adding those notes to the state, resetting the current, currently editing note, and shows a successful notification to the user. And that's it. I love how easy it is to follow what's happening once you know the syntax. Sagas really let you write the process flow of your application. And finally, here's a modera app, moderator app that I built for a game called Werewolf. So you can see you can add players, pick the characters, and go through what is actually a really complicated process uh, for this particular game. And games have a lot of business logic because there is so much process flow to control. The options available on each step heavily depend on every action that has been taken before it, which is quite a contrast to most apps, which are more like a spread out list of options with less dependencies. Here are the selectors, and again, a change. This time, they've been included as a single separate file instead of with the reducers. You can see the create, uh, so the uh, action creators here are as simple as can be because they're using a really nice utility called Redux Actions. It does feel a little boilerplate-y, that's for sure, though. And the reducers are relatively simple, too. That's because in this app, pretty much all of the processing logic is actually in the sagas. Because it's a game, I was finding it really difficult to keep the flow in my head over multiple types of files. And having the ability to centralize it all into the sagas was a total lifesaver. So that's my story about selectors and sagas. Hopefully, you've gotten a few things that are useful to you, and it's inspired you to think about the architecture of your application. Thank you very much.